Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for those who are here in the room and any of those who are virtually uh, or come on later. Thank you. Um, I'm Rocky Houston. I'm the Parks and Lands Division Manager. Uh, we're here to talk about possible improvement plan. It's, a, it's an update. We're, we're moving to an annual update process. We'll get into that a little later. Uh, with me as well is uh, David Stuyck. He's our Parks Planning and Development Manager. In addition, I have Amy Wooten, who is one of our capital uh, program staff, and Cindy, Cindy G, who is here to assist with us. Uh, make sure we're doing it right. Use our communication. Aficionado. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go over our process. So prior to us coming here today, we've been doing, uh, we did the adopted the approach plan and then doing inventory and trying to get work done this calendar year, updating to determine what we can get done and looking at it. Uh, so today's sort of our first open public meeting. We had opened our public comment period a couple weeks ago online and have uh, received a few comments that way. This is a way to enhance that and uh, continue to move that through the end of the month. So that public, public comment period uh, ends next, what is Sorry, I'm 26 here, but uh, I think online it might say the third day on, on the website. Um, so, and then uh, we're going to go to the Parks Advisory Board and we'll report back the update of the draft plan that, uh, that, that some of you have a path and, uh, and the feedback that we get. And if there's any changes, we'll make those changes to that. Um, following that, the next day we have a council work session. So we will uh, present uh, a very similar presentation there talking about um, our findings, feedback that we got from the community and uh, answer any questions they have more of an informal work session level. We'll follow that up a week later on the 18th, actually six days, uh, and a, a hearing. So then that's where we'll have a hearing. And what they'll be doing there is, is taking testimony and uh, making uh, a decision to adopt a resolution. That resolution would um, adopt this capital plan to update the one that is in our current capital plan and the proposed plan. It also would update our natural areas acquisition plan and really it essentially updates our pros plan uh, to do that. So um, pre COVID, during COVID, we had the. Uh, Sorry, thank you. We had the, the pros plan and we went through that process that was uh, longer than it usually is um, to uh, come up with a, a final uh, pros plan. That was adopted in April of this year. And that. Uh, it's called an acronym for Parks Recreation Normalcy. Thank you. Apologize. I try not to do that, but yes, pros is uh, Parks Recreation Open Space Plan. It's a requirement of the RCO to, to get grants and be eligible for some of their grant program. and also allows us to RCO Recreation and Conservation Office. Thank you. Yes. I'll see if I can get another one. Um, and not only does the revised code of Washington uh, require us to do the growth management act to have a capital facilities plan in a a sort of a capital plan uh, forecast for the next 20 years. Uh, there are other revised code of Washington that require us to do um, growth plan to meet certain eligibility for this grant program. So what we have uh, in the pros plan, we referenced it and now we're acting on it. It's changing from a six year capital plan process into an annual um, capital improvement plan process. This allows us to be responsive to changes in our resources as they go up and down, as well as uh, reflective of uh, major maintenance, development, other things as those opportunities. The uh, funding sources that we utilize, next slide, please. Uh, conferences, uh, several uh, funding sources you guys are probably familiar with. We have our REIT funding, which is a uh, excise tax for real property, it's actually REIT that we 
we have our eligible for, and that's limited to just major maintenance and development projects. We have uh, what's PD? Why am I missing that? Oh, okay. Uh, PD. Yeah, it's the park improvement. Yeah, sorry, that acronym just threw me off. See, it got me. <laughs> yeah, real estate excise tax. Real, real, real estate excise tax. So if, uh, if you sell your home in Clark County, you have to pay a uh, certain percentage, 1.5 escalates and on the site. That money then goes into a fund to, um, and there's two types, there's REIT 1 and REIT 2. REIT 1 uh, goes, all right, MTD. All right. So that, uh, please, thank you. Um, REIT 1 goes for uh, general office improvements for the, the county and other things. And REIT 2 is dedicated for for parks and transportation types. So there's a, a, a committee that the quest on an annual basis and PD is actually it's a it's short for the Greater Clark Park District Fund. So that's the levy that is issued if you're within the Greater Clark Park District boundary. Uh, essentially the urban growth boundary City of Vancouver. Those funds are dedicated for preventative maintenance operations as well. I would not speak for major maintenance. Flexibility to meet uh, the recreational needs within that Greater Park Park District. TIF or Park Improvement Fund is a fund that uh, is a fee that's attached on your building homes uh, and commercial structures to meet the um, Park improvements for that added development. And there are uh, several districts around the Greater Park Park District. Um, and they, the boundaries are almost the same, but they're a little different. I don't know why, they're just a little bit different, but essentially they, they follow the Greater Park Park District. And those funds are for acquisition and developing new stuff. It's about meeting that new, uh, new development. And those funds, um, are regulated by by the county and for code uh, and based off of uh, what you're you're building. We've got about 14.2 million for capital development and another 4.7 million. And to be to clarify, this is the money that is specifically identified as the 23 on capital improvement. So the 23 to 20, excuse me. So over the next six years, these the pools of money that we're looking to draw from, and and, and those amounts. The general fund is a uh, another um, fund that we have to um, pay for our regional parks. Typically, that's where regional parks are paid out of outside of that Greater Clark Park District. Uh, see, we got about four point eight million nine hundred five. Help offset some of those. Um, and legacy lands, that's a uh, otherwise known as conservation future. That's a levy that's issued on part of your property tax, somewhere between, I don't know, 10 and $100 a year that uh, goes into a pool to acquire property and maintain open space and natural areas. So it's about conserving that quintessential uh, Clark County. And then others. So others can be a variety of things, but a lot of times those are branch funds. You know, Six year, list the projects we've identified a couple of projects that next slide uh, would be would meet certain grant criteria for certain partner organizations identified in the projects in the larger credit sheet. This is one that other actually you don't have this right to stop the funding to bring it down like different buckets of money. Um, but we have a number of projects where where. Playground and access accessibility improvement and a parking lot or something like that, that or a building that that would score high and and competitive grants by that. So we've identified those projects for that. So that's that's where that pot of money that three point two million dollars comes from. Different 
So. So it's part of it's part of this spreadsheet. If you want a copy of this spreadsheet, there's just a bunch of these columns. No. Um, we'll talk a little bit about park and um, park districts, um, but but the projects um, that are that are specifically mentioned in that spreadsheet, um, there is a column that shows which park district this is, but um, for the purposes of making these readable, I'll in that column. Um, but I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so I'm just going to sort of jump in um, at this point. Rocky, I want I wanted Rocky to talk a little bit about the budget and money, um, and um, part of my responsibility with the planning and development team is uh, developing the six-year plan um, in collaboration with Rocky and with our operations folks um, and our planning and development team, and to um, develop that six-year plan and then set it at the community and then get going on it. Start making these improvements. And so this is a, a that big spreadsheet at a glance. Um, it represents the, the major areas of um, spending that we have that, um, that, that come out of the capital improvement plan. Obviously we have parts that we need to continue. Uh, and so those preventative maintenance dollars and to a large extent the major maintenance dollars go toward maintaining existing uh, park elements, not necessarily adding new elements to the park. So um, in some cases with the major maintenance dollars, you might do a project um, example of the orchard parking lot where we're going to do such a renovation to the parking lot or to the Hazelbell parking lot. We're going to do such a renovation to the parking lot and don't recommend the parking lot. Um, and so there are some larger projects in that major maintenance with this process. Uh, the capital development projects are what you would expect. So those would be new park projects. Um, and then the acquisitions is both acquisitions for park development and uh, conservation. So the legacy land dollars uh, are represented in this uh, spreadsheet as well. The two columns, the one that says fiscal year 2023 uh, forecast spending is what we what we have proposed in the in the 2023 to 2027 CIP for the But now that we've gone through this annual um, renewal annual revision uh, process, um, we have the right column, which is the new 2023 spending. Projections uh, for this version of the CIP, this revised CIP. Um, and you'll notice that there are some big differences between the numbers. Um, the primary difference is that Curtin Creek, which was projected in the 2023 to 2027 CIP, was planned to be constructed in 2024, and we're going to have um, completed drawings and permits. So we could start building that project in 2023. So what we did was we took the money in the 2027 budget for Curtin Creek and moved to 24 and 20. That does a couple of things for us. It gives us the flexibility to bid it if the bidding environment occurs, that we're really struggling to get um, get projects that we can afford to build. Um, and we're hoping that the bidding environment includes by 23, but it also gives us flexibility because the money's in a bucket sitting over here um, to wait till 2024. If you think of the buckets that we have that Rocky just went through, I think of them as savings accounts. And when we go through the CIP process, we're just asking our partners, the council, the public, uh, the parks advisory board. Can I take this money out of my savings account and put it in my checking account so I can spend? Here's what we want to spend our money on this year. And what do you think? What do you think, Parks Advisory Board? What do you think, Alan? So, and the bottom table is just a comparison of the numbers um, by year because this new this new capital improvement plan does go from 2023 to 20. The other thing that I told a lot of people when I'm talking about here is 
if you look at that spreadsheet and you get out under 2028, the specificity of the project gets less and less because I don't necessarily have um, an exact idea of what I might lose my money to make money on. And so every year, what we're going to do is we're going to project, we're going to perfect the next year. So, like in 23, we'll project 24, and we'll, we'll, we'll perfect 24, and we'll project 23. So, we're always going to have a six year plan that we're going to do. That's the idea. Next slide. Um, so, some of the di big differences I did mention Kirk, uh, Kirk Creek. We also did add a million dollars um, uh, to make public. Um, access improvements at Harris Farm, one of the um, conversations that we've had once of the year. Um, and internally, man, with our Harris Farm partner, there's a weapon, an improvement project going on the Creek that um, is one project that we want folks are working on. And we're trying to dovetail with that and make some trail improvements and make some larger public improvements so more the public can enjoy Harris Farm. And that those public improvements are based on a master plan that was up 2010 master plan was updated to 2019 and starting to think about dating those recreation improvements. We also expanded the capacity of our preventative maintenance program. And we are developing, haven't quite got, gotten there yet. Um, we're developing a list of deferred maintenance projects um, and prioritizing those projects. Right now, it's not quite a squeaky wheel, but it's but it's a conversation that we have with our food chiefs, our ops our manager, and between Rocky and I, and we can visit the park and say, hey, this really needs to We want to add a little bit of structure to that process so we're not missing um, something that we haven't looked at. And so we're doing a big inventory uh, of the GIS folks um, to try and do that inventory and analysis and develop that main priority list. The other reason that we have um, preventative, the preventative maintenance program has grown is we've got to we have a little bit more staff capacity, we hope, and I have applied, um, after talking to Rocky about it, I've gone through and I've applied a 10% growth over the next um, six years in those job areas. That's in one place if it doesn't do off a little bit. Um, and if it does do off, uh, we'll be able to handle uh, a little bit more here this year before. And that's quite possible to taper off um, what we, in theory, get a handle on our improvement. Lots of people like to talk about that in there, but it's sort of like paint the gold big bridge, never really quite get it done. Did you have something you wanted to add? No, I would just say that um, as we're moving through and doing this inventory uh, and, and the pros plan, Park Corporation Outdoor Space uh, plan, we, we had talked about developing a rubric for uh, prioritizing um, projects. We've got that tool and it's looking from uh, several lenses, uh, whether it's from a, a DEI or social equity lens, as well as safety, uh, looking at geographically and we're allocating things, looking at leveraging. So if, if Marty brings in $2 billion and said, All right, he wants to have a uh, we're starting with the donation program, <laughs> a dog park that goes down 20 stories and goes up 10 stories and things. There's a leverage there then that we would be trying to, um, that would give us some more points versus something where it's all around. But we have a great point from like that. Uh, and then sustainability, another one of those criteria. Oh, and then an operational impact. Overall criteria that we're looking at to score. And then we put in meetings like this, through staff and through all of here, gather that set, the data to help us um, develop a plan that's kind of put in place. And David's going to go through each one of these sort of uh, types of projects and kind of talk about what, what 
we're defining that as. It's in the plan as well, but again, kind of go through that. So I, I don't want to go through these line by line. If you have specific questions, we'll, we'll, we'll do some Q&A after the presentation, but I did want to go through it by major category. Do so you understand what preventative maintenance means? Um, and these are just uh, definitions that are copied and pasted out of the plans we have in front of you. And so preventative maintenance, we have that's broken up into pavement preservation and then you know, applications out of trade. Um, and so the pavement preservation money might go toward pavement uh, restoration, renovation, preservation, just keeping them from falling apart. Big right? deal. Have a lot of asphalt to deal with. Um, we have uh, structural preservation, which is what you would think it to be. It's uh, replace roads on actual structures, bathrooms, shelters, heat, siding, dirt, all that. Not from the line runs in, but still something that we need to do. Um, one of the nice things about this um, this park system is we get we get uh, to do two things. We get to be good stewards of the facilities that we already have, and we get to build some new things. That's pretty exciting. So, um, these are preservation dollars. So, vegetation management, Rocky had mentioned that we spent a whole bunch of money cutting down hazard trees in the past year. We're going to continue to cut down hazard trees. Uh, we have them in our parks, we have them on a hazard tree green structure, basically. Um, it's a complicated um, process, uh, and historically we haven't had a whole lot of success getting contracted. We had real good success this year. We're getting ready to do our third round of apple trees this year. Um, but I'd also like to start focusing some of the vegetation management maintenance money on replacing vegetation and that either over here or die has died. Uh, Trying to make things look a little bit better, not wait for a reason. Beautification. Um, and then there's park money preservation, um, which is placing, about to think of the word, placing building playground elements, uh, refurbishing playground sorts of things, those sorts of things that aren't, that don't rise quite to the big maintenance level where they need to. Very consultant to do some of the design work. Those sorts of projects would come more clearly um, in that major maintenance, maintenance list. These are things like the climb like shelter, which we this year finally got moved, um, and we're hoping to get replaced here um, in the fall or early spring. It is permanent, um, it's shoreline permanent. It's real complicated to. Take care of something like that. So that's typically when the project gets bumped up to maybe maintenance. And it's also um, if it's a cabin, like a function cabin. An example is we're going to replace the, um, we're going to work on potentially replacing the pump and filter system on the flat. So and it's replacing a significant uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, again, projects that like you might find, find under uh, major maintenance is restroom replacement, uh, playground fall surfacing replacement. Um, you'll notice in the, um, in the spreadsheet at the bottom of the major maintenance category, um, we've identified I think $500,000 a year to do uh, playground surfacing replacement with locations if you do need to send the public road rights, the five parts a year um, to replace the wood chips with um, with tiles. Um, we may not do that in every park, um, but the parts that make sense to improve accessibility for um, people, uh, we're going to go through and do a sort of a prioritization process and do that. Um, the reason that that shows up in a major maintenance major category is because it's sort of a program. And in and of its own, and those will be catalyzed by me because we're, if we take out wood chip, we're replacing something um, that is a um, biodegradable. So, um, another um, 
shelter replacements, things that are replacing something that's already been taken. Whenever we get into having something like the Hawaii playground, that becomes what we would call a capital. You'll also notice in the CIP, um, there's an emergent project category in there for the things that we don't know are going to happen this winter or this spring. Um, and that need to be addressed. So we have a, a bucket of emergency money um, to address the things that, that crop up. Um, and so hopefully we can take care of that my online shelter um, in a shorter time. But the, the way that our, our, our program is set up, it's not a, a slush time, so it's not a contingency where, oh, cool, we can do this extra thing because we haven't had an emergency. It, it's defined clearly so that it's it's something there for that moment. Again, to um, respect the process, to make sure that um, managing the funds and the resources. There is a process to go through to move money around, but it's Requires us on back to the um, The only reason I bring that up is because of the billion dollars of charity farm. Um, if the if the wetland project doesn't get done at charity farm in a timely manner, um, we might use that money to to pay the project for the specific location, but that requires a process. We, as I said, it's not just this big chunk of money. My pet problem is over here, and I'm just going to spend, spend that money over here because I can't spend it over. So, uh, capital development is another um, item, and I've sort of lumped the last three categories in here capital development, acquisition, and, um, and uh, equipment, vehicles, um, which, after reviewing the slide show on the Zoom, uh, uh, the document itself it just doesn't really talk about equipment. We'll probably make a revision to that before we close the comment period. Because um, I believe we have $100,000 a year over the next six years uh, to replace vehicles and farmers to add a lot of new equipment. Yes. Tools. $100,000 a year? Okay. So I, I want to just clarify. So we have a, um, a repair and replace fund. Yeah. So we make like a lease payment. So existing in stock. We have a refund. But what we what happens is sometimes the, the new thing costs more. And so this helps pay for that. And more importantly, is we now we need a, a widget now. And we don't have a widget to stop it. This allows us to buy the widget to deal with a little bad, you know. Yeah. So do we want to talk about specific things? A chipper. Yeah. So we're we've got proposal one to get a chipper. We don't have a chipper. Uh, the windstorms that we had, and we have a lot of trees, so we have a lot down. So we either have to rent, rent one at a pretty high cost, or wait in line uh, and borrow one from another division. And so we've identified that that's a business need, and we can use it enough to recoup that cost from use versus renting it or, or doing those things. So that's a new piece of equipment. Uh, we're looking at getting smaller trailers. So instead of having every trailer be an 18,000 pound. 24 foot long trailer, so it fits everything. And but then you have to have a, a one and a half ton truck and, and those things. And once you get into the little neighborhood park, it's a little harder than that. So again, we're trying to have if you have a small mower, we're going to have a smaller trailer. So those are additions to our our equipment that that fund would be going to. Last question: Is that hundred thousand dollars a year? It's one truck. Yeah, it's it's intended to be a supplement. Um, to the to the money that we're adding, I think we're probably spending anywhere from six hundred to two million a year in replacing our fees. Yeah. Yeah. So that um, so in this so in this. Uh, in this spreadsheet, um, there's two projects that we're currently capital development projects that we're, there's three that we're currently um, working on design drawings for. Two, I apologize. Um, that's the Harmony Sports Park. We have a consultant on board that's doing uh, design and permit drawings for that, and then Curtin Creek Community Park. So the, the Harmony Sports Park project is a, a safety and parking improvement project. It started back in 2018. And uh, 
you know, it's planned to be built this year, a lot of construction, it's not ready. It's at 60% design. And so that's where that project's being moved into the fiscal year 23. And that's partially funded with the grant and partially funded through the And then the community creek, community park, which I spoke about moving in from 24 to 23. That's why the number went from um, way not significantly past development. Um, it's a regional park at uh, Kirk Creek. Kirk Creek is in, uh, I think it's in top, uh, 119th and 72nd. Yeah, and it's uh, got like two, two fields. One of them is a completely planned, um, one of them is a natural turf rugby field, and the other is a original turf soccer field. Um, initially, it was planned to have one stop. Baseball improvements. Um, we're currently working on excited um, in that project for our budget, given the current building environment. Um, we may have to phase some of the improvements at that point. I think we're doing it with more than one fell swoop. Um, and so we're working on our 60% drawing. Um, we should have 90% drawings done by, um, by the end of the year. It has a, a nice Side playground, our community park playground is usually around five or six thousand square feet. So it's about that size, maybe as much as eight. Um, and it's got a, a nature play area. There's going to be two uh, park shelters, one large shelter that will be reservable, and a smaller shelter that will be reservable with restrooms to serve the back and the for the, the ball field. Um, the initial plan was to light those fields. Pickleball courts, pickleball courts, yes, and two pickleball courts and basketball, a basketball court, also in about a futsal and football, yeah, and combo, and there'll be about a mile trail as well that'll yeah. go out to overlook uh, the mountain benches and some work. Yeah, so those are the those are the notable development projects. We've already mentioned the million dollars at Nerdy Farm. Um, and then there's the um, new neighborhood park development and new community park development. <clears throat> it says sites to be determined. Um, we're currently going through a, um, a reevaluation of our prioritization for development place. There's 17 parks, 17 undeveloped properties. When we did our 23 to 27 park recreation and open space planning, we um, got a new level of service analysis for our different park districts. And we're just going through the process of reevaluating our developed, our undeveloped properties to make sure that we have the, the, the list of development in the right order. So we don't currently have any saying this is absolutely 100%. So that's, a, that's different than the 22 uh, 27 plan. Yes. Are nine and a half acres of community park or neighborhood park? That would be a community park. That size is typically yes. Yeah. Typically, our community parks would have parking, a bathroom, <coughs> shelter, some sort of a some sort of a formalized um, sport facility. We'd love twenty or thirty acres, right? And so this and so this to be determined process. So we have, as I mentioned, there are 17 developed properties. Rocky sort of touched on the prioritization project when we were process when we were talking about um, especially on this process. Uh, when, when Rocky was talking about prioritizing maintenance. So we have um I'm talking about development. Yeah. So I, we're doing the same sort of thing with development. Um level sort of level of service in the park district in which the property is located. Um and uh, the return on investment, which for me means how complicated it is, is it to develop the, the piece of property? Um, are there wetland constraints, habitat constraints, soil constraints, zoning constraints? Um, is, um, are there topographic constraints? There's, there's a lot of things that drive the cost of, a, of the development of a park. Um, and, and those have to be considered 
Um, and so we're currently at the point where we've done all of the sort of regulatory and environmental review work on the prop on the, on the properties we currently have. Um, we've we've ranked them by the tip district areas, uh, and we've got a spreadsheet that that will amalgamate a number of a list. Um, and I'm doing the um, evaluation blind. Our park plan is doing about the evaluation on how and then we're going to compare our lists and bring it to Rocky for a conversation about it. And we will be bringing that to the Parks Advisory Board um, sometime before the end of the year to go. Because we need to hire, we don't have staff to do park master planning, we have to hire a consultant to do that work, and we need to hire a consultant so we can do a master plan for um, a new neighborhood park. Um, we will start that process next year. So we don't have the, what we're trying to do budget slot into what those are going to be in the future to allow us the time to go through our process and, and have a, a robust engagement to then define what those, those properties are and so the public can ask us to prioritize lists It will be. Yeah. You'll have a document there. But there will have a presentation. Do it. Did you say the rankings over all of my park districts? So where uh, it, it's um, it's by park district uh, in regards to, uh, but it's it's more about uh, proximity. So if you look in our pro plan, parks recreation and open space plan, uh, you're going to identify some heat maps to identify walkability elements, and so we're utilizing that. So we're trying to identify what's where are those close to home neighborhood recreational opportunities, and using that as a scale from the park district. So we want to make sure that we're distributing distributing our parks throughout the greater Clark Park District, but also making sure that we're we're dealing with the uh, park deserts as well uh, in that prioritization. So that, that's part of that process. And what we had in the previous um, capital plan was a list that had been plugged in there that was carried forward from previous uh, calendar years. And what we're just trying to do is double check and make sure that those parts that we had identified um, Previously, are those still the highest priority for the first few years? At some point, you're going to have a prioritized list. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like a park for me at yep. the end of the year is where that is. Yeah, correct. So, um, if you look at the um, from the plan, um, I don't remember what section it's in, but there, that each of the pit districts received a grade. Um, and while that's not the only reason that we would prioritize a park in that district, we have several park districts that uh, be or an F um, as uh, and how well we were providing service um, at that neighborhood park level for that area. That's one of the criteria that we use. And as I was yes, both community park companies. The service area of the community park is larger than this. So, um, I don't, I, I was trying to find the whole plan so I could share that with you. I should have got a copy of it with me. Um, it will be our presentation to the Parks Advisory Board that will just remind them that um, <coughs> this was one of the criteria that we needed to evaluate. Uh, it's November. Um, we're going to shoot for the end of the year. I'd like for it to happen in December. We'll be putting out. Um, We'll be putting out the same sort of uh, public notifications for that meeting um, that we did for this meeting. And Cindy and I will circle back and look for that email list and get it in the email. They meet like every third Tuesday or something like that. It's every second. 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 It's the second Tuesday. It's, it's, it's a regular. Yeah. yeah. In this meeting, in this room. So, um, and this is, this is something that we're going to. Uh, this evaluation is something that's going to occur every six years because we will update the park plan. We'll get a new um, sort of level of service analysis that tells us where our park deserts are, and then we'll go back through this evaluation process and we'll restore um, the sites for that for that one column, and we'll revisit things like return on investment. Do we have partners that that would make that property score higher? One of the things that I've I've noticed. When I've done my sort of environmental and regulatory analysis, is we have lots of properties that are significantly encumbered by habitat. 
And so the, the, the requirements to develop some of those properties is what we would call our traditional neighborhood of the park um, is significant given the permitting timeline that's going on. Um, and so that is going to that's going to weigh into the entire and maybe what we build of that property. Yeah. So if that property may and be more of a natural right. area versus a, a fully developed neighborhood park that, that looks like our other. So, so those are those are the things we're trying to look through that feasibility from a, a buildability as well as a, a, a need assessment. And and I don't have to tell you guys that you know in six years this community is going to look differently. You know, there's so many. So much development in so many areas. You look back six years ago, and again, we're trying to look at where where all those houses being built relevant to our, our property. So something that was way out in the country six years ago now has 400 houses. Yeah, so, yeah. And so we're trying to again look through all that stuff to um, help us build it in the right spot for us. And and we have we have one of the benefits is that we have money. But we don't have enough money, nor do we have enough staff to go out and build three or four boxes. Our goal is to build, you know, a park um, on a three-year cycle, and so we do design one year, permitting one year, so master plan one year, design and permitting one year, construction the third year, and then we we have one community park sort of in that pipeline, and then we start a neighborhood park. Like the way that. The way the plan is, we start the neighborhood park first, and then next year we would start a community park, and then we would be building a park every um, every year, every other year, once we get it that sort of over that third year. So, and that all depends on staff. I can tell you that sometimes the permit takes depending on the complexity of the site. So. Um, we have talked about the, um, the detail, and then this is sort of the overall, and this number changed um, by uh, a couple million dollars because I found an explosion there and we went through that. Um, so you might have looked at the number uh, in the previous slide, and there's kind of 74 doesn't line up with the number, but um, it's just quite a complicated spreadsheet. These are the actual numbers. Um, I did break out the acquisition numbers just so you get a sense for um, how much of the, the, the acquisition money is going towards conservation projects versus um, actually development. You have money um, for, for both. So it comes from different projects and projects here. Um, and then, of course, that uh, $600,000 for equipment and vehicle maintenance. Um, and that's quite a big number. Still really good. And half of what it was in the uh, 2015, the last growth plan. We're trying to not be aspirational, be a little bit more realistic. It's still aspirational, uh, but at the same time, all, all the numbers for those different funding streams, uh, we were running through our, our our finance team to determine is there sufficient resources forecast. To also meet this demand, so we're we're doing that checks and balances. The last thing we want to do is um, say we're going to spend seven dollars on there too far. Um, the seventy-four million that was identified there does seem some have some uh, grants and other funds resources, so there are some constraints there for sure. And kind of on home prices and development and all those things, you know, we could have. I want to say, you know, another 2008, 2010 sort of cycle, and then this whole thing gets revamped. And that's just another reason why we're going to the annual process. Um, responsive to those, those real world busts and moves. Um, and the biggest bust. Yeah. Six years ago, who knew that the park would cost twice as much to build? So, so that's. It, unless Rocky has anything to add, to just no. We're here to move on to questions. questions. It's the boring part that leads to the fun stuff. You know, is sort of clean up our plan and our initiatives to then ask things 
uh, improvements to park. I think the only thing I'll add is that as we look forward and we do this inventory of our existing assets, I think we're going to identify a lot of uh, deferred maintenance or major maintenance things that need to be accomplished, uh, especially in the Greater Clark Park District. We've uh, we're hitting that 20 year mark about for for a lot of our parks and uh, we're getting that useful life. And so now we're going to start seeing pavement wearing out. You know, walking around Hawaii, you know that pavement, that trail is starting to get pretty uh, pretty bumpy. Possible right? start to see playground equipment worn down and starting to get repaired, broken. So there's all those sort of things that we're going to start adding. And that may take away from some deferment. We want to make sure that what the assets we have are polished and working at as soon as possible, be as safe and enjoyable as possible. Um, otherwise, we have what I call the gold plate of the church, is that you know, if we run around building new stuff and we're not maintaining what we have, it's not a good investment. So when we do questions, while there is no one on the we do have uh, oh, two two, two. okay yeah. um so if you have a question um do we need to turn it over to the city so she can explain all the oh, the fancy web action rules well yes if uh, there is someone on the phone and if they do have a question they would just need to click star three on their phone to raise their hand and then everyone's muted on the phone. So raise your hand if you want to ask a question. We'll go ahead and unmute you. And then there is one other person that is attending virtually as well. Um, there is a raise hand option. And we'll go ahead and call on them. And you can also type in. And so if yes. you can't, uh, if the raising your hand function isn't functional, if you're like me, you can always type in um, a question and we'll. And we'll we, do, we do actually have one person um, with their hand raised. Sure. All right. Let's and this is for Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. You're live at the Capital Planning Day. Um, I have a question about the Heritage Farms. Heritage Farm, um, in, I think it said in one place that it's not PIF eligible. And then um, the other thing is, is if you could put a little bit more understanding around uh, public access and the monies that you see going to, I guess, improving or um, allowing more public access? Sure, so the, the question is, um, uh, the summary is, is, why is the Heritage Farm not eligible for, for park improvement funds? Um, so that, and then the second part was funds going to accessibility um, and how it's being allocated and where. So for the, the first part of that uh, question, um, quite simply is Heritage Farm is not a park. It's a farm. And currently, uh, and we just had this reviewed, uh, we thought if we had a recreational element attributing to that access and recreation that would be eligible, but um, the review identified that that was not going to be eligible. So, huh. And then the um, the money that we've identified uh, for recreation improvements uh, at the uh, farm in 23 um, is focused on trail uh, development, and uh, it, it revolves around the uh, Wellens project and along the Cedar Creek corridor. Um, Intended to be sort of an interpretive trail um, for the clean water project and for some of the farming elements at the, at the property. Um, it by no means will build all of the trail um, at, the, at the farm. Um, and there's also uh, potentially enough money to build um, shelter, uh, potentially a bathroom. Um, a public bathroom at the facility, um, all would be north, located north of Cooper Creek. Look at the master plan that you can find online. Um, there's a plan, there's a, there's a vision for a new public building on the north east corner of the property near the light on 70. Um, 
and that's where the, uh, the concentration of the recreation improvement take place in that first phase of uh, public improvement uh, at the farm. So, so, so. yes, ma'am. Are you still there, ma'am? Teresa? Well, we wait to see if we can get her back. Can, her question from can, you, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so the pub increased public access would not be to the farm area as much, but to specific areas that you're anticipating will be more recreational. And then Will people be able to have parking near that and just enter it? It seems to me like right now, in order to get into Heritage Farms, you have to have a code or a key. There's something that you have to, in order to, the public just can't get in. So, um, you're correct. The current access is as limited uh, as many of you may, may not know is that we're, we're just kicking off a, a sustainability plan or something called a business plan to look at co two core things, which is uh, increasing public access uh, to the farm, as well as looking at sort of the uh, uh, business, you know, the return, making sure that the, it's uh, more productive from the cost, the cost of life to the county and look at ways that that could be, whether that's charging on for every water or, or whatever those things may be. But we're looking at those measures and working with Washington State University and just kicked off a uh, steering committee to work on that. So you're right, currently it is. And I think through this process, what we're looking to do for, for the project would be is, is viewing the future of what the outcome is um, associated with that sustainability plan. We already have a master plan that's identifying some of those elements and this will be implementing a, a few of those elements. And because we have a uh, wetland enhancement project that's being done by clean water, uh, we, we're trying to make sure that we, we're, we're shovel ready timing wise to allow a, a interpretation of that work uh, and, and integrate that in with that the planning effort we're doing. I don't know if that helps clarify. I think I'd just add that the, the current access is an operational um, uh, decision or current, current operational practice. Um, that would be evaluated during that through the sustainability plan um, and, and the, the specific elements um, that would get designed and improved as a part of the public access improvements out there would be informed by any business um, sort of operation decisions that are made with regards to gate access versus no gate access, um, access from a different location um, for the public. Um, and so it's hard to it's hard to exactly answer what you know what, what we plan to do to enhance public access there. We just know that that uh, that uh, we want to, and we've been we've been tasked by council to do that thing. So that's what we're setting out to do. I have one more question that's not related to Heritage Farms. Okay, and that is um, you're dependent upon PIF. And developers um, pay those costs for housing that they're building, but with increased density and lack of affordability, and um, developers passing that on to the homeowner or the renter. How does that work um, with keeping your PIF funds up? When that's being, when those, when those costs are being passed on and we're already seeing so many people not able to get housing. So, are we lowering our PIF fees? How does that work? Um, so, the parks division, parks and lands division is not um, in charge of those rates and fees. So, that is something that is uh, others are responsible for that. Of course, we can raise our hand and say we need more money, we need less money in regards to that. But there's a process that goes through a rate assessment. Um, you're correct. If if there is a reduction in development, uh, there will be a reduction in PIF funds. 
Um, that hasn't been the case historically or since we've had PIF funds, but doesn't mean that can't change tomorrow. I think in 2008, we saw a decline in, in park improvement funds or development housing being uh, built. So that's, that's um, the great thing is we have several legs to our, to our, our funding stool, and that's just one. Uh, it's limited only within our Greer Clark Park District area, roughly. Um, and those are those um, challenges we hope never to have. But as we start to see forecasts that are showing a reduction, then we would be engaging with, with council and, and others to talk about what is the right, right thing. I know other communities during COVID in Oregon had pause some of their fees for low income housing or have a different rate structure. I mean, there's a, a, a plethora of avenues in regards to how to try to address it. And uh, unfortunately, I agree that housing is gosh darn expensive right now um, and it's going the wrong direction for me. But um, I, all I'm, I'm on the other side is trying to make the livability through the parks. And, as great as possible so those who are in the community or moving into the community uh, have that other element uh, and a space to get outdoors and to recreate. Well, especially given that the council passed that interim ordinance allowing developers the possibility of combining landscaping and recreation area around high density housing. So if on one hand, we're going to allow developers to combine those two important things, landscaping and recreation area, especially around high density housing, then it's really important that we look at what other recreational facilities and walking distances and everything else our parks are. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, we are, you know, in the pros plan, we looked at that walkability skill as another rubric in, the, in assessing our, our, our level of service for parks. So, you know, I think we are um, attempting to look through different lenses at, at what the community needs are and that level of service. And um, that's as much as I know about it. So. <laughs> I just think that interim ordinance is interesting if that passes and the impact that puts on on um, open space around high density housing. Well, I can just say that as a nation, as a state, as a Northwest, um, COVID has already provided an increase in outdoor recreation and park usage. And with the opening up of uh, the community after COVID, there is a reduction, immediate reduction in that use. And so um, we're already seeing that pleasure of having more people in our parks. Uh, sometimes that means our trash goes a little bit higher and puts more pressure on us to, to uh, do these capital plans and really be very strategic in where we're placing our dollars. So, you know, it's, um, it's the fun of uh, community building and, and, and trying to look at these um, these issues from a lot of different angles. We do have a question here in the audience, Marty. about um, how do uh, 
Um, gentleman asked me a question. Um, represent the dog park. How 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 does how do they advocate for park dog parks? So they end up on our development radar, um, and um, that's through the primarily through the growth plan and through conversations like this and the participation of the park advisory board. And um, I think you know, there's, there's two facets. It's definitely is. is um, you're part of an organization and your members have ideas. And so you can look at our portfolio and say, hey, what about this? And, and present that. You know, we have a structure to have that, that communication. Uh, and as new parks are being master planned, um, that's an opportunity to, to bring forth and those would be vetted through at that point as we're developing or looking to develop that new property. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be site limitations. Um, I used to do a lot of trail work and we had a lot of interest to do equestrian trails, and we have a lot of interest here in Clark County. Sometimes it's just having the space for horse trailers exactly. in order to be able to have have that use. And so those are the sort of things that we just, it's always trying to uh, balance all those needs. Uh, so I think those are two great ways to have uh, dog lovers come to those meetings and, and talk about and, and promote. And when we have our surveys and other things, is um, Communicating those needs. This could get a thousand people come to one meeting, raise your hand, and always mean that there's going to be a thousand dog parks or dog parks, but it's just another mechanism to help us measure um, the interest level, the capacity to help, and it's a partnership. So, you know, and I think your, your organization is, is one where there's partnerships to help um, add additional capacity for, for that we couldn't do on, on ourselves by ourselves. Understood. So we had uh, our to do that. We're going to do that. So they uh, came in for us to be able to document that by that section. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, okay. In the in the last year, you know, when I've met with people who want pickleball and integrating that into different places, sure. which wasn't something that had been planned in previous master plans. We're looking at mechanisms to uh, update master plans, small or major. Uh, oops, uh, cricket. Yeah. yeah, something I've never never developed in in my twenty years uh, of government. But there's a growing interest. There's, you know, field in Portland and Salem, you know, and so again, there's a, uh, as the demographics change, those recreational interests change, you know, next year's going to be, you know, unicycle mountain biking on your flight sport. But, so. Well, I appreciate that, that guidance. Any other questions online or in the audience? Any comments, any suggestions? Build this park. Um, I want I want a zip line, Rocky. Okay. Hold on, two hundred seventy pound man. What about bocce ball? Oh, bocce ball, yeah, it's at the Western Shuttle. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have several questions. The ones that I hear about. Okay. And one of the things that we done for our survey. So in the pros plan, we had I think so. The question is about how many respondents we've had from survey. Sorry. Thank you for our those online. I, we are recording this, so people can listen to it later as well. So the, the answer without the question has less value. Right. So in, in the pros plan, our survey I think we did two surveys. I'm probably going to be off by a couple here, but. I believe we had 26 or 2700 respondents to the first survey, and then we had another almost 1000 in the second follow up uh, survey to that. In addition, we did a bunch of 1 on 1 and other uh, smaller meetings with, with groups uh, to. Um, because we couldn't do the typical public meeting for we had probably between 13 and 15 public meetings. As opposed yeah. to having yeah. for specific needs. I'd have to go back and look at whether some of them were specific user groups versus specific neighborhoods and see 
what the individual groups were. Um, I prepared a, a presentation for the adoption of the pros plan. Um, and that's when I had done research on, with, on our public process, because it was a very unique public process getting forward. We, we weren't having open houses. We weren't having presentations. I only heard about one of those uh, surveys in the environment that were sold in the Ampa stock and the Phoenix stock. So, but I'm hearing from other people that they were surprised that you are already going with the counselors in here and yet they didn't have the opportunity to speak because it's not public to conduct the survey. But then a lot of people do not have to. A lot of people in the North County have no white house. A lot of people in the West Palaya have no white house. Believe it or not, some of being 300 or some dollars and upwards to get the white house in some areas, but they don't have it. So that excludes quite a big chunk of people that have not had the opportunity to see that if they were notified that you had the opportunity. I, 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 I'll be the, the response was is there's a lot of people in the, in the community that the areas don't have computers or access to internet um, due to connectivity issues. Um, and a lot of people didn't know about the surveys and engagement that we were working on in the previous uh, pros plan. And, and I'll agree that uh, no, we could have been better. Always, I'll be the first to admit that we're, we're always in the need to improve that. What I can say is that our uh, responses to the survey were um, significantly higher than they were in the 2015-2016. So there were, uh, it may not be so perfect, but there was an improvement in regards to response uh, from there. And, and given the limitations we had, that we, we did a good job. We did a great job? No, but we did a good job to get us to where we can continue to move forward um, with delivering the, the capital programming service. And do remember that some of the city beaches are restricted. Uh, those in some population that have no access to the African to the white. It's pretty cumbersome to go to the white beach in West of the city of Some of them don't subscribe to the Colombian or any other newspaper because they do not have the money if they have a subscription. So you leave a big chunk of the population. That is in desperate need of those to some open recreation that is cheaper than belonging to a recreation of other people have money to do so. So I can tell you quite a lot of things, and not just uh, from uh, our east side, but also from Burberry, Lisa Bell, North Sandler Creek, and also down towards the city of the So Unfortunately, those people also pay the rent. Those people also pay the open space and the storm water and whatever else fees are attached to their bills, whether they're renting or not. So, whether they own or not. But those 2600 that you had mentioned in 2700 for the second survey, some of those were new people. I had some very proud people that told me that they canceled the survey. But then also there was no control as to who, where, and how it was. Sure. So the the uh, the response was, was that some of the survey people had uh, participated in both surveys. And that's correct. It was not a scientific blind survey or random survey that was going out during that. Did not have surveys to prove the um, it wasn't statistically significant because it wasn't entirely random. But it was so unincorporated area. Unincorporated um, city of Vancouver within the greater part. No, unincorporated. Not the city of Vancouver, not Battleground. But no, no. I, I'm trying to define it within the greater part park district or in the county. Because I, my understanding is about 157,000 people in the unincorporated Greater Clark Park District within the PIF, PIF areas. Uh, in regards to Hope County, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Because we don't pay for the city of Vancouver's part of 
Well, if I live in the city of Vancouver, then yes, I would be paying for it if I own the, own the home. The Greater Clark Park District encompasses all of the city of Vancouver and unincorporated um, urban growth boundary of the park district. But what I'd like to get to is you, you talked about that you're you're having a lot of complaints. Well, it's concerns. So, so what I'd like to know is what what no. are those in regards to um not a complaint. I'm looking at this. No, no. Don't see the this district. I don't even see the I mean there's a lot of TV district. Greater Park Park District. T V D. Be determined. You're correct. Okay. But then also, um, I have a question about a little bit fun because it said that it's a fine lot of cost. And of course, when we went planning before that, there were other things that I was involved with without Because that's a resource for. But you're saying that it's a farm, not a park. Then why is it happening? Well, why isn't it a park? If we spend that money for public access right now, we'll have to come out of the general for all the money um, that the county spends on Heritage Farm comes from. So it comes out of that general fund budget. Then you mentioned that there's going to be a public building here. What? That hasn't been determined. It's still oh. public. A conceptual from the 2019, actually from the 2010 master plan, they identified in that corner a, a, a footprint for a future public building. And so that's exactly <laughs> that's where it is so in the master plan. Make sure you go on Facebook and uh, send it to the applicant. So, but anyway, um, so if I can, if I can respond really quickly to your comment about the to be determined. Yes. Um, so all of the to be determined down in the acquisition list are because we haven't identified specific. Yeah. So I'm not worried about it's the TBD that are in a capital development. That's uh, those are associated with. We're currently going through, um, and we confirm that. Um, that our old priority list um, still um, is responsive to the new level of service analysis done in the current public plan. Okay. So those there were specific projects identified that were responsive to the 2015 pros plan, okay. and we need to go through the process and reevaluate the level of service um, that is that we're currently facing. Um, after the analysis is completed for our 23 to 27 project. Those, those projects that were previously identified could be the projects at the top of the list, but they may not um, based on the current level of service. So the Cougar Creek Greenway and the Cougar Creek Trail had a $2 million allocation back in 2000. That's no longer on that. To be a very important trail system and park. So that park moves. I had volunteered to show other organizations that have some of the storm water equipment, but they also were getting ready to build a park. It's a trail for neither. So you're correct, it is not there. The trail that you're referencing. So the question is, is Cougar Creek Greenway Trail, Cougar Creek Community Park, Cougar, actually Cougar Creek Woods Community Park, yes. were on prior capital plan and they're currently not represented in this iteration. That is correct. Um, what happened to those? It wasn't spent. Okay, the project, I know, but it's the project. So the trail 
which is one of those core recreational connectors and amenities, uh, it, as I understand it, is a partnership between clean water, uh, sewer districts, and parks. And it's it's like dominoes. So you have to have one domino hit for the other and the other. And there is no timeline for that work to get done, which then sort of puts, so that puts a, a constraint for us in building a, a trail because we want to make sure that we're being, um, not building something that then gets torn up because now they're putting in a sewer line or doing those other things. We're trying to balance those things to make that uh, cost effective. And in regards to the community, the Cougar Creek Woods Community Park, that's a lot. Um, that is really a chose to call it. <laughs> it's, it's just like Salmon Creek Community Neighborhood Park. It's it's kind of like two part classification things, but anyway, regardless, on off top, that is in the T. It's one of those TB TBCs potentially as we go through this process. So as this calendar year progresses and we come back to the Parks Advisory Board and get some input on on the rubric and identifying those priorities, so that we can make sure we're meeting all of the Greater Clark Park District level of service needs. It could be determined that. Um, the level of service for a community park in that area, boom, number one. It could be number two, it could be number three in regards to community parks. And then we would vet that out and, and move forward through a, through a process. Well, it was there from 2006 to 2012. It is still there on the left side, all over on this side. So how much longer will they have to live together? Remember, this is also in a CDB area that services back in Jamia area that is needing needs to have some sort of a to just walk safely <laughs> and have a parking lot right there that has, I don't know, where the quarter goes to be flying. So there was a parking. So the, the, the question is, when is Community Cougar Creek Woods Community Park and Extra Call. And I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, the CPWCP is a call. Let me know. Hi. Yep. And not just from the adjacent subdivisions that are reaching for this property. They are the ones who say this part. It gets a bit of a, in exchange for a failing by application up north. Out of the so they're all wondering what's going on and why is this not on the phone? They did not know what to do to be done by accident. So, but also, if you're going to go and not short term to go to the counselors, I would suggest that you have to be the number three. Mm -hmm. There are many grants available out there. And we have a lot of experience in writing grants. And we've been asking for some of the grants to be applied for, including for no child left behind for all of one of these areas that you can build on that. That's the residents having to get involved. And we did spend a lot of volunteer hours, so we did spend a lot of uh, investment. We also have promises of more donations. What is your age? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, unfortunately, the school has the time it's established so that you could apply for reimbursement. So that kind of sort of killed the partnership for almost years. So that's something. And then the client line kits, fishing that are there every year. Um, we've had a lot of disabled folks and disabled volunteers that are, and thank you for bringing me this to the attention or after the board provides your attention. <laughs> and we had an input session on why the veterans should get free money. Disabled veterans. That's great. Let's get some of our volunteers back. But then also, when we were watching those kids flashing in there and everything else, and then where's the last one to leave the park? 
in the new ground them there. And they're keeping the case with the blood. I don't think you have to get a good for this way. You have to be planning for a lot more expanding than what you need to have. Small little water bubbles or a, what they call them, water sprinklers or whatever. So, the other thing that's necessary for you guys to go back and review what's there, or can you come up with some innovative ideas for that particular part since you have it on your agenda uh, that would limit the costs? So, the question is, is that at Klein Line, there's a uh... A lot of fishing, access for fishing for disabled people, as well as the um, splash pad that has um, is on our capital plan for some improvements. And is there some ways to do something innovative to reduce the cost and enhance or make the uh, experience better? Catch that? Well, sort of, but some health problems. And, and so, if we were to start over, it'd be a several million dollar project. To redo all that. And so what what we're currently doing right now is we're uh, trying to contract with the manufacturer to come down and uh, train my staff and assess where we're at currently to look at those innovative ideas. So over the since I think it was installed in 2005, we've done a lot of repairs okay. to it. To, the, to a lot of repairs to it with non. Um, Matching parts, we'll call it. So we we jerry rigged it, using my terms, to make it continue to function. And it's the point now where we um, have to start over and replace a lot of the big parts, or and then that's cheaper than doing the whole thing over. Or by having this complication, we can see um, are there some do we have to do less? So for example, we just went down there and vacuum pumped out the uh, what's that like a tank? I can't also call it a filter tank. Uh, with, with sand and redid that uh, and did some other uh, small repairs mm -hmm. and we uh, tried prior to Labor Day and we've seen great performance only a couple weeks but great performance work daily we were out there this summer uh, with it breaking down and having to um, make repairs to get it operational um, and there's this so we are trying to find the least expensive and it um, this consultation and this and this work with the manufacturer, um, Vortec, I think the term is effective. That seventy-five thousand dollars, I believe, is what we have budgeted in there. Fifty. It's one hundred fifty. Oh, one hundred fifty. Maybe seventy-five. See, you might have seventy-five, not, not one hundred fifty. It was seventy-five. It was. Yeah. It went up to one hundred fifty. So, uh, so we can re hopefully reduce that cost. I mean, that allows us to do some other things. The other piece for accessibility right now at Flying Line is. Um, we have an old bridge that um, when we were in there repairing, removing the old, the sink, uh, we broke some um, some boards, and so now we're in the process of re replacing those. Yeah, and making and having the structural assessment done to ensure that oh, okay, we can just put some new boards on it, and it's fine, or um, no, and getting it properly loaded so. The next time we make sure we are tires in the right spot and it's the right load, so we're not overloading it because um, those vacuum trucks, I know you've seen those big huge things, um, drove across and we'd hate to have that thing fall into the crate. Right. So, And, and I know that we, uh, so the question is, there's some people using our park to the decline line that a house lives in, and um, it's kind of what are we doing about that? That's my interpretation of that. So um, if if you're having any feeling unsafe or have any concerns of this emergency, please dial 911. If it's not an emergency, but there are some concerns or rule violations, enforcement issues, 311 is, is the core activity to go to. My staff, can educate, but we we don't have the enforcement uh, uh, leg at this time to be able to do so. We are aware of um, a couple or two that are um, creating some issues, and we've been actively trying to track them down. 
it's it's like falls over across the Oregon Trail. It's an encampment from the day before or something. Yes. But we can't. Yes. And, start a movie. Just yeah. and so we're we're continuing to try to work through that and work with the sheriff's department and the uh, the nonprofit that's working with Topless to connect people to services. And we've been successful in other park areas. Um, at Orchard, we've had some some issues there. And we've continued to, to be proactive with our community partners to um, address those things that are allowed. Um, it's an ongoing issue, and it's beyond just parks, of course. I know we're getting close to time, and yeah, we, we might have more questions about capital improvement plan, and not operations. If you have any more questions about the capital improvement plan, the entire direct, and that's the group. That was a question. It was a combination with the fire department. Yes. Yeah. Sure. The question is, how is the property at Cruising Creek worth purchased? And it was a partnership with the city at that time. Um, the planning element of the park was with the city. I think it was bought in 1999, and there's a fire department there. And yes. It, it is a partnership. You're correct. So are the costs going to be split this week, please? Just right now. Is it, um, it's still in our jurisdiction, so I mean, it's now in our jurisdiction. But um, I thought that the city had done something extra because of how partners are interpreted. So is that coming back to the county or is it shared cost? So the question is is the city and, um, a partner in funding a Curtain Creek? And so at the time, my understanding is I wasn't here is that the funding was that to acquire the park portion, the 16, I think 16 acres, uh, was came out of uh, park funds that were associated with that district, that area. And the city is through, I don't know, uh, that the fire department, if they have different funds or not, but the city paid for um, front eight or eight acres or something like that. And so, they're they're not contributing to the development of the park. We are working with them because we have an easement through their property and are trying to look to sort of subdivide and clarify that as well as um, the road improvements. We're working to um, work through those elements. So there are there is a partnership and an engagement. Uh, is it a fiscal one in, in offsetting those costs? Um, I wouldn't say that specifically. I'd say the, the closest we're going to get to partnering on that is. Um, Furniture improvements. We, we may not be responsible for making all of the furniture improvements um, when we develop the park. Working through that, as I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned Curtin Creek, the right sizing that project, um, given the sort of current fitting environment, and that's one of the areas that we're looking to, um, to sharpen the pencil. Um, yeah, the 50% cost increase of about or three years on the estimate side. And so um, it, we're not looking at phasing it or, or value engineering and looking at all those elements to make sure that um, we can afford what we what we develop. And and it's just as equally important as what we do develop has the recreational impact that it does. Anybody else have a question? I think there was uh, one more from Teresa. Okay. Right here. First off, I, I want to thank you as a member of FOCC because I'm here representing us and just listening to what you're saying. So thank you for bringing this to the public. Um, the previous speaker addressed a lot of topics and it was difficult to hear her. It was helpful when you restated her question and then answered it. I, I don't know if when this is put back on, you know, so people can listen to recording or see a summary, if there's any way we could just see what some of her key points were and what your responses was. I know she talked about equity as far as surveys and equity as far as where parks are. And it sounds like that you're really looking at what parks you did approve, what parks have been in progress by having a criteria to reprioritize, which is good. Um, and then she addressed some other issues that sounded interesting, but we couldn't hear her. And the other thing that I don't really expect you to address, but just to bring up is the whole idea of tree canopy in our parks is in relationship to climate change and maintenance of our trees and especially planting of new trees. And so that's it. Thank you. 
So I, I, I'd like to respond to the, your, your comments about tree canopy. Um, that's part of the reason why I would like to try and uh, transition some of our vegetation um, maintenance money to replanting. Um, it feels really bad to go out and cut down 30 or 40 trees in a year and not replant anything, especially as a landscape architect. Um, and also, one of the things that we're talking about internally in the planning team and in operations team is, is creative ways to add more shade to our parks. One of the things that we haven't done in the past is put park shelters in our neighborhood parks, but we're considering doing that um, to provide shade in our neighborhood parks. They'd be non reservable uh, facilities, whereas our community must typically be shelter is reservable. Another thing that we're talking about doing is covering our, our playgrounds. Um, with with seasonal shade, um, with big canvas um, uh, sail structures that get taken down in the winter, so we can try to have them last longer than four or five years. And so, um, as a as a planner um, and a site designer, uh, climate uh, effects um, on citizenry and and these extended periods of temperatures in the high nineties and in, Frequent days over 100. Um, one of the things that we hear is uh, shade, 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 shade. Uh, you know, and I think another thing that we're, we've been looking at piloting is, is, is clover in some of our, our uh, park in, in lieu of uh, areas where we don't irrigate um, or that we are irrigating to irrigate less. And so there's a uh, dwarf white clover um, that doesn't have to be mowed as much or at all. Uh, this requires less water, returns nitrogen from the water, and it meets some of the requirements for pollination. So it provides uh, food for pollinators. Uh, so it, it has a lot of those benefits. The downside, I think, for something is uh, you get more stains on your clothes um, for, for whatever reason. And, and you know, some of our playing fields maybe there. There'll be some. Uh, some, some impacts there. So, you know, I think we're continuing to look at all sorts of things and, and try to pilot some things in some small areas to see if it's um, effective. And so I think that's as, and it is, if anyone has thoughts and ideas, we're, we're definitely open to listening and, and learning some of these ideas of what other communities are doing and seeing if that's something that uh, can be a part of what we're trying to do. I think it's, it's, it's important from many environmental organizations um, that we continue to look at climate and the effects of climate and, and you're right, how do we service our communities and things given the rising um, heat in the summer and, and what vegetation do we plant and what vegetation are we going to lose because we can't afford to water it. So, thank you. Absolutely. And um, they use a lot, a lot of sunshine, but not much water. And but also there are native plants that are very much um, appreciated by the kids. So especially in those areas where you have them. No, that is true. Well, and um, if you or or those that you know have additional comments, we have. Uh, a dedicated email address uh, online that you can go to um, to our, our Clarks County Parks page under our project uh, link, and um, there is a, a, an email that you can click, and it will email directly to us. Uh, you can also um, email David directly. Uh, his, his contact or call David directly here. Uh, can't get hold of David. Uh, there's always Cindy. I know. I mean, there's, there's Cindy as well. I'm always here. I have to, to, to to contact as well, though, to to uh, ensure that our um, we capture things as, as best we can. That uh, email that we've dedicated on, on the web page is, is uh, our preferred method, just to make sure it's all in one spot, so it looks like it for us to to move it or moving things around. I want to thank all of you. Uh, for coming out tonight and, and uh, participating in, in this and providing us some, some good feedback. And I, I look forward to hearing more uh, from everyone and the rest of the community uh, as we move forward through this process and, and, and next year and the year after through these capital plans. Thank you.
So with that, are we uh, to that point now?